All right. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about sample means. In the past, we've talked about sample proportions, but as we talk about sample means today, we need to keep in mind the types of data that we're talking about. When we talk about proportions or sample proportions, we're talking about um, a certain number of things expressed as a percent. So a proportion as a percent um, or part of a whole. When we talk about sample means, we're talking about the actual numeric value. So instead of saying, you know, 50% of the M&Ms were red, we'd say 25 M&Ms were red out of a sample of 50, except we kind of exclude that out of. So it's, it's talking about data that's more uh, able to be measured using means. A for example would be proportions, the proportion of people that have Netflix on their computer. Sample means would be what is the sample mean of um, the data for this group? What is their height? What is the average height? Okay, so let's look at the important ideas here. We're going to divide this top box in half, not quite exactly in half. And we're going to have two boxes up here. Important idea, sampling distribution. When we look at the sampling distribution, we're still going to be thinking about the center. The center of the sampling distribution, the expected value, uh, the mean of x is going to be equal to the mean of the population, and our variability is going to be expressed in terms of standard deviation, and our standard deviation of our sample is going to be our, sam our standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. In this box here, we're going to talk about shape. If the proportion, sorry, if the population is approximately normal, and we're still exploring this concept, so approximately normal, then the sampling distribution of x bar, meaning the sample sampling distribution of all of the sample means, is also approximately normal. We're going to be looking in our prompt to see is the original population approximately normal, and that's going to allow us to say that then our sampling distribution is approximately normal. So this a particular diagram is going to look very familiar. So here's our sampling distribution. Let me use a different color here. Of X bar. Our picture is going to look also familiar. We're going to have our little curve here. And we're going to have our capital N by it in there. We're going to have the sample mean. We'll have our sample standard deviation as expressed by our formula given and our z-score for finding the probability or the area under that particular part of the curve is going to be equal to our x-bar minus our true mean over our standard deviation. This should look vaguely familiar. It looks a lot like what we did for proportions, except we've adjusted the formulas because we're not necessarily talking about proportions here. We're talking about means. To the point that I made earlier, Look at the prompt. What type of data are we dealing with? And that's going to tell you and dictate to you what formulas are we going to be using, what are we looking for, and what are we measuring. As we walk into this, check your understanding. I want you to keep in mind that pausing here is a good idea. You can work on this example, trying to go through each one step by step, and you can come back and watch my explanation. Here's the prompt. Every day, people watch 1 billion hours of YouTube videos. That breaks down to every single person on earth watching YouTube videos for about 8.4 minutes per day. For US teens in any given day, the amount of time spent watching YouTube videos is approximately normal with a mean of 18.5 minutes and a standard deviation of 5.3 minutes. When we put this context, sorry, when we put this example in context in this section, it seems obvious what we're doing. We're, we're using means. Well, what do you mean? Why would we confuse that? Well, when you get a, just a problem and you're trying to discern, am I using proportions or means, keep in mind what uh, information is given. They give us a mean of 18.5 minutes. They give us a standard deviation of 5.3 minutes. Those two pieces of data uh, can help us kind of identify that we're going to be using the formulas for sample means. Here's part A. Find the probability, keyword there, 
Think about what process we're going to follow to do that. That a randomly uh, chosen US teen watches YouTube for more than 25 minutes in a given day. The process that we normally go through to find probability would be to take the normal curve and the area under the normal curve. When I draw this, I would love to say that it's normal. And how can I say that it's, it's normal? And so what we're looking at is we're looking at um, a curve here. And in our prompt, it says that it's approximately normal. So this is a pretty straightforward execution here. So normal with a mean of 18.5 minutes. And I'll put that in here. A standard deviation of 5.3 minutes. The portion of the curve that we want to find is 25 minutes. Uh, more than 25 minutes. So I'll draw in my 25 here. And we obviously want the part to the right because that's greater than. I can do this two ways. I could take Z and typically our formula is X minus X bar, but we actually have the population mean here, which is, which is a good thing over the standard deviation. So our Z is going to be 25 minus 18.5 over 5.3, giving us a Z score of 1.23. And from table A, we get that that is 0 0.8907. So to get our answer, we subtract that from 1 because that would be, this is our 0 0.8907 over here, right? So our 0 0.8907 is all this. So we would do 1 minus 0 0.8907, which is equal to 0 0.1093. That's our 10% here. So 10.9%, just about. There's another way to figure that out, as you probably are thinking. Why wouldn't we just do that? I want to show you both ways always. We can also use normal CDF. So if we do normal CDF, we for sure need to label our inputs into our formula because that's what's going to be required. So if you use this on the AP exam, you can always use your Z-score uh, Z score formula and follow it through using table A, but you can also use your calculator function, but you can't have a naked function, meaning you have to label what each of the pieces are. So we'd say that our lower is 25 and our upper, like 999, our mean is 18.5 and our standard deviation is 5.3. When we plug that into our calculator, we get 0 0.1100. Mr. Saris, those are two different numbers. How do I know which one is correct? Well, that's why it's important to show the work that you did. So if you do the work using the z-score in table A, what they will be they will accept that. If you do the work on the calculator and label it, then you get credit for uh, the 0 0.1100. So both of those are acceptable. So here's where the new stuff comes in, right? So now we're going to talk about taking a sample. Suppose we choose a simple random sample of 10 US teens. Let X equal the mean amount of time spent watching YouTube videos for the sample. So the likelihood is that it's not going to be uh, equal to 18.5. Uh, but when we start to talk about a sampling distribution, we're talking about all the possible samples of size 10. In this case, our n is equal to 10. That is our number in our sample. So the mean of the sampling distribution of x, uh, because they're, uh, it's approximately normal, then our means are going to match. So the mean of x bar is equal to the mean, which is equal to 18.5. Not that our sample is equal to 18 point, our sample mean is equal to 18.5. The mean of our sampling distribution, all of them together is 18.5. Calculate and interpret the standard deviation of the sample distribution and verify that the 10% condition is met. So what we need to do to make sure we can use the standard deviation formula is we need to verify that the 10% condition is met, which means we need to verify that the number that we're taking out is less than 10%. So our n is equal to 10. And we want to verify that 10 uh, is less than one-tenth of all us teens and obviously you can find out that that is true very quickly so we don't necessarily need to show a number on that we just need to show that the 10 percent condition is met and once that's met then we can use that formula for standard deviation which says standard deviation of our sampling distribution 
is equal to our standard deviation of our population over the square root of n, which means we're going to have 5.3 over the square root of 10, which gives us 1.676. So it shrinks it down because we have uh, the sampling distribution we're taking care of. When we interpret this, what we'd say is that it describes the variability. So the amount of something typically varies from something else by. So the mean number of hours uh, spent watching, and I'm putting this is context, right? Watching YouTube in a sample of size 10 of US teens typically varies from the mean of 18.5 by 1.676. So very important to put that context. So I have to have all this to make sure that I can talk about my standard deviation in relationship to my mean effectively. So you've got to have the context in there and you've got to have your numbers in there as well. Now this is the pH de resistance right here, right? So now we get to that step where we determine, you know, what is like, what is the probability of something? Find the probability that the mean amount of time spent watching YouTube for the teens in the sample exceeds 25 minutes. How is this different than how is this different than the first question that we asked? That's that's kind of the, the piece here, right? So they're both asking about 25 minutes. So what's the what's the difference? Check out in part A. It says find the probability that a randomly chosen U.S. teen. So a randomly so one teen. So you pick out one teen, and we want to know what the probability that they have more than 25 minutes logged on YouTube in a given day. Down here, we're saying that the mean amount of time spent for YouTube meant spent watching YouTube for the teens in a sample. So that would that would mean instead of cherry picking one teen and finding out their number of hours and what the probability of that one thing happening, we're taking an average of a group of teens and saying, what's the probability that that average compared to all in the sampling mean is greater than 25 minutes? Which one do you think is more reliable? If I cherry pick one or if I have a sample of 10? Well, when you increase the sample size, the variability goes down. So the likelihood of having a mean, meaning the average from a group, that's as far out as potentially one single value is, is lower. Let me say that again. When we have a group of people, it's going to bring, so you're going to, you may have that bigger value, right? But you also may have a, slow, a smaller value. So the variability is decreased. So that sample is going to give you probably a better, closer look at um, what potentially the true mean actually is or, or, or what might actually happen. So here we go. So, and we're going to see how this plays out with the probability, right? So there was a an 11% chance that they had more than 25 minutes in a given day, one team. So let's look at what happens down here. We first need to see what the shape is. And because our original is approximately normal, we know the sampling distribution is approximately normal. When I draw this in, my mean is still 18.5. This is normal with a mean of 18.5 because remember the means match right there. Our standard deviation changed because we changed our sample size. So our standard deviation is 1.676. And we're still asking about that 25 number and we still want to know greater than. When I evaluate this, I can do it one of two ways, right? So I can do Z is equal to my X bar minus my mean over my sample or over my sample standard deviation in this case. 25 minus 18.5 over 1.676. Check this out. Now my Z score is 3.88. It was 1.23 before. Mr. Sayers, how can this possibly happen? How can the same exact numeric value, 25, have two different Z scores? Well, remember, our standard deviation changed. Our variability went down. Let me say that again. We used to have a standard deviation of 5.3 minutes for an individual. When we consider people as part of a sample, our standard deviation goes down. That's because as you increase sample size, 
variability decreases. So I have le it's less variable. So an answer of 25 minutes is way far out there because you'd have to have a sample of 10 teens with a lot of people that fell into this 11% category, right? You have to have a lot of people that watched a lot of YouTube. Given that it's a 3.88, if we use table A, we'd get 0.9998, and that's this over here, because table A always spits out at or below. So our answer then would be one minus 0 0.9998, which would be equal to 0 0.0002. So it's very, very unlikely less than 1%, less than one-tenth of 1%. It's very unlikely that you'd have a group of 10 people who watched that much YouTube. Whereas up here, it wasn't all that unlikely that you'd find a person, a single person that would watch that much YouTube. So when we compare what the sampling distribution does to picking an individual, what we see is that we get a more reliable peak at what exactly is going on with the sample with the number of people so i can pick one person and say oh well it must be close to 25 because i just picked a random joe off the street well that's not necessarily true it was an 11 percent chance of doing that but if i pick a group of 10 people that have to have this high average then i've got to look at okay what's going on here is it really that the average is 18.5 did i just get really lucky and pick a just happen to pick a group of people who watch a lot of youtube and that's what we're going to continue to talk about throughout the semester but that's the basics. That's the difference between sampling distribution and just a, uh, a single person. And keeping in mind where that comes from, right? We, it comes from the fact that we adjust our standard deviation based on our sample size. Because as sample size increases, variability decreases. All right, guys, that's the basics of sample means. 